Chapter 20 Cellular Communities, Tissues, Stem Cells, and Cancer Cells are the building blocks of multicellular organisms. This seems a simple statement, but it raises deep problems. Cells are not like bricks. They are small and squishy. How can they be used to construct a giraffe or a giant redwood tree? Each cell is enclosed in a flimsy membrane less than a hundred thousandth of a millimeter thick, and it depends on the integrity of this membrane for its survival. How, then, can cells be joined together robustly to form a muscle that will lift an elephant's weight? Most mysterious of all, if cells are the building blocks, where is the builder and where are the architect's plans? How are all the different cell types in a plant or an animal produced, with each in its proper place in an elaborate pattern? Figure 21. Most of the cells in multicellular organisms are organized into cooperative assemblies called tissues, such as the nervous, muscle, epithelial, and connective tissues found in vertebrates. Figure 22. In this chapter, we begin by discussing the architecture of tissues from a mechanical point of view. We will see that tissues are composed not only of cells, with their internal framework of cytoskeletal filaments, discussed in chapter 17, but also of extracellular matrix, which cells secrete around themselves. It is this matrix that gives support of tissues such as bone or wood their strength. The matrix provides one way to bind cells together, but cells can also attach to one another directly. Thus, we also discuss the cell junctions that link cells together in the flexible, mobile tissue of animals transmitting forces from the cytoskeleton of one cell to that of the next, or from the cytoskeleton of a cell to the extracellular matrix. But there is more to the organization of tissues than mechanics. Just as a building needs plumbing, telephone lines, and other fittings, so an animal tissue requires blood vessels, nerves, and other components formed from a variety of specialized cell types. All the tissue components have to be coordinated correctly, and many of them require continual maintenance and renewal. Cells die and have to be replaced with new cells of the right type, in the right places, and in the right numbers. In the third section of this chapter, we discuss how these processes are organized, as well as the crucial role that stem cells, self-renewing undifferentiated cells, play in tissue renewal and repair. Disorders of tissue renewal are a major medical concern, and those due to this misbehavior of mutant cells underlie the development of cancer. This disorder will be the topic of our final section. The study of cancer requires a synthesis of knowledge of cells and tissues at every level, from the molecular biology of DNA repair to the principles of natural selection and the social organization of cells and tissues. Many fundamental advances in cell biology have been driven by cancer research, and we will see that, in return, the basic science has borne fruit in a deepened understanding of the disease and a new optimism about its treatment. Extracellular Matrix and Connective Tissues Plants and animals have evolved their multicellular organization independently, and their tissues are constructed on different principles. Animals prey on other living things, and often are preyed on by other, by other animals. And for this, they must be strong and agile. They must possess tissues capable of rapid movement, and the cells that form those tissues must be able to generate and transmit forces and to change shape quickly. Plants, by contrast, are sedentary. Their tissues are more or less rigid, and their cells are weak and fragile if isolated from their supporting tissue framework. The strength of a plant tissue comes from the cell walls, formed like boxes, that enclose, protect, and constrain the shape of each of its cells. Figure 23. The cell wall is a type of extracellular matrix that the plant cell secretes around itself. The cell controls the composition of this material. It can be thick and hard, as in wood, or thin and flexible, as in a leaf. But the principle of tissue construction is the same in either case. Many tiny boxes are cemented together, 
with a delicate cell living inside each one. Indeed, as we noted in Chapter 1, it was this close-packed mass of microscopic chambers seen in a slice of cork by Robert Hooke three centuries ago that originally gave rise to the term cell. Animal tissues are more diverse. Like plant tissues, they consist of both cells and extracellular matrix, but these components are organized in many different ways. In some tissues, such as bone or tendon, extracellular matrix is plentiful and mechanically all-important. In others, such as muscle or epidermis, extracellular matrix is scanty, and the cytoskeletons of the cells themselves carry the mechanical load. We begin with a brief discussion of plant cells and tissues, before moving on to those of animals. Plant cells have tough external walls. A naked plant cell, artificially stripped of its wall, is a delicate and vulnerable thing. With care, it can be kept alive in culture, but it is easily ruptured, and even a small maladjustment of the osmotic strength of the culture medium can cause it to swell and burst. Its cytoskeleton lacks the tension-bearing intermediate filaments found in animal cells, and it has virtually no tensile strength. An external wall, therefore, is essential. The plant cell wall has to be tough, but it does not necessarily have to be rigid. Osmotic swelling of the cell, limited by the resistance of the cell wall, can keep the chamber distended, and a mass of such, such swollen chambers cemented together forms a semi-rigid tissue, such as the state of a crisp lettuce leaf, figure 24. If water is lacking so that the cells shrink, the leaf wilts. Most newly formed cells in a multicellular plant initially make relatively thin primary cell walls that can slowly expand to accommodate cell growth. The driving force for growth is the same as that keeping the lattice leaf crisp, a swelling pressure, called the turgor pressure, that develops as the result of an osmotic imbalance between the interior of the cell and its surroundings, discussed in Chapter 12. Once growth, once growth stops and the wall no longer needs to expand, a more rigid secondary cell wall is often produced either by thickening of the primary wall or by deposition of new layers with a different composition underneath the old ones. When plant cells become specialized, they generally produce specially adapted types of walls, waxy, waterproof walls for the surface epidermal cells of a leaf, hard, thick, woody walls for the xylem cells of the stem, and so on. Cellulose microfibrils give the plant cell wall its tensile strength. Like all extracellular matrices, plant cell walls derive their tensile strength from long fibers oriented along the lines of stress. In higher plants, the, longer fi the long fibers are generally made from the polysaccharide cellulose, the most abundant organic macromolecule on Earth. These cellulose microfibrils are interwoven with other polysaccharides and some structural proteins all bonded together to form a complex structure that resists compression as well as tension. Figure 25. In woody tissue, a highly cross-linked network of lignin, which is not a polysaccharide or a protein but a different kind of polymer, is deposited within this matrix to make it more rigid and waterproof. For a plant cell to grow or change its shape, the cell wall has to stretch or deform. Because the cellulose microfibrils resist stretching, their orientation governs the direction in which the growing cell enlarges. If, for example, they are arranged circumferentially as a corset, the cell will grow more rapidly in length than in girth. Figure 26. By controlling the way that it lays down its wall, the plant cell consequently controls its own shape and thus the direction of growth of the tissue to which it belongs. Cellulose is produced in a radically different way from most other extracellular macromolecules. Instead of being made inside the cell and then exported by exocytosis, discussed in chapter 15, it is synthesized on the outer surface of the cell by enzyme complexes embedded in the plasma membrane. These complexes transport sugar monomers across the membrane and incorporate them into a set of growing polymer chains at their points of membrane attachment. 
Each set of chains forms a cellulose microfibril. The enzyme complexes move in the membrane, spinning out new polymers and laying down a trail of oriented cellulose microfibrils behind them. The paths followed by the enzyme complexes dictate the orientation in which cellulose is deposited in the cell wall. But what guides the enzyme complexes? Just underneath the plasma membrane, microtubules are aligned exactly with the cellulose microfibrils outside the cell. Figure 27a and b. These microtubules are thought to serve as tracks to guide the movement of the enzyme complexes. Figure 27c. In this curiously indirect way, the cytoskeleton controls the shape of the plant cell and the modeling of the plant tissues. We shall see that animal cells use their cytoskeleton to control tissue architecture in a much more direct way. Animal connective tissues consist largely of extracellular matrix. It is traditional to distinguish four major types of tissues in animals, connective, epithelial, nervous, and muscular. But the basic architectural distinction is between connective tissues and the rest. In connective tissues, extracellular matrix is plentiful and carries the mechanical load. In other tissues, such as epithelia, extracellular matrix is scanty, and the cells are directly joined to one another and carry the mechanical load themselves. We discuss connective tissues first. Animal connective tissues are enormously varied. They can be tough and flexible like tendons or the dermis of the skin, hard and dense like bone, resilient and shock absorbing like cartilage, or soft and transparent like the jelly that fills the interior of the eye. In all these examples, the bulk of the tissue is occupied by extracellular matrix, and the cells that produce the matrix are scattered within it like raisins in a pudding. Figure 28. In all of these tissues, the tensile strength, whether great or small, is chiefly provided not by a polysaccharide, as in plants, but by a fibrous protein, collagen. The various types of connective tissues owe their specific characters to the type of collagen that they contain, to its quantity, and, most importantly, to the other molecules that are interwoven with with it in varying proportions. These include the rubbery protein elastin, which gives the walls of arteries their resilience as blood pulses through them, as well as a host of specialized polysaccharide molecules, which we discuss shortly. Collagen provides tensile strength in animal connective tissues. Collagen is found in all multicellular animals, and it comes in many varieties. Mammals have about 20 different collagen genes, coding for the variant forms of collagen required in different tissues. Collagens are the chief proteins in bone, tendon, and skin. Leather is pickled collagen, and they can constitute 25% of the total protein mass in the mammal, more than any other type of protein. The characteristic feature of a typical collagen molecule is its long, stiff, triple-stranded helical structure in which three collagen polypeptide chains are wound around one another in a rope-like superhelix. See figure 425a. These molecules in turn assemble into ordered polymers called collagen fibrils, which are thin cables 10 to 300 nanometers in diameter and many micrometers long. These can pack together into still thicker collagen fibers. Figure 29. Other collagen molecules decorate the surface of collagen fibrils and link the fibrils to one another and to other components in the extracellular matrix. The connective tissue cells that manufacture and inhabit the matrix go by various names according to the tissue. In skin, tendon, and many other connective tissues they are called fibroblasts, figure 2010. In bone they are called osteoblasts. They make both the collagen and the other organic components of the matrix. Almost all of these molecules are synthesized intracellularly and then secreted in the standard way, by exocytosis, discussed in chapter 15. Outside the cell, they assemble into huge, cohesive aggregates. If assembly were to occur prematurely, before secretion, the cell would become choked with its own products. In the case of collagen, 
The cells avoid this catastrophe by secreting collagen molecules in a precursor form, called procollagen, with additional peptides at each end that obstruct assembly into collagen fibrils. Extracellular enzymes, called procollagen proteinases, cut off these terminal domains to allow assembly only after the molecules have emerged into the extracellular space. Some people have a genetic defect in one of these proteinases, or in procollagen itself, so that their collagen fibrils do not assemble correctly. As a result, the skin and various other connective tissues have a lower tensile strength and are extraordinarily stretchable. Figure 2011. Cells and tissues have to be able to degrade matrix as well as make it. This ability is essential for tissue growth, repair, and renewal. It is also important where migratory cells, such as macrophages, need to burrow through the thicket of collagen and other extracellular matrix polymers. Matrix proteases that cleave extracellular proteins play a part in many disease processes, ranging from arthritis, where they contribute to the breakdown of cartilage in affected joints, to cancer, where they help the cancer cells to invade normal tissue. Cells organize the collagen that they secrete. To do their job, Collagen fibrils must be correctly aligned. In skin, for example, they are woven in a wickerwork pattern, or in alternating layers with different orientations so as to resist tensile strength in multiple directions. Figure 2012. In tendons, which attach muscles to bone, they are aligned in parallel bundles along the major axis of tension. The connective tissue cells control this orientation first by depositing the collagen in an oriented fashion and then by rearranging it. During development of the tissue, fibroblasts work on the collagen they have secreted, crawling over it and pulling on it, helping to compact it into sheets and, drawn, and draw it out into cables. This mechanical role of fibroblasts in shaping collagen matrices has been demonstrated dramatically in cell culture. When fibroblasts are mixed with a meshwork of randomly oriented collagen fibrils that form a gel in a culture dish, the fibroblasts tug on the meshwork, drawing in collagen from the surrounding and compacting it. If two small pieces of embryonic tissue containing fibroblasts are placed far apart on a collagen gel, the intervening collagen becomes organized into a dense band of aligned fibers that connects the two explants. Figure 2013 the fibroblasts migrate out from the explants along the aligned collagen fibers. Thus, the fibroblasts influence the alignment of the collagen fibers, and the collagen fibers in turn affect the distribution of the fibroblasts. Fibroblasts presumably play a similar role in generating long-range order in the extracellular matrix inside the body, in helping to create tendons, for example, and the tough, dense layers of connective tissue that and sheath and bind together most organs. Fibroblast migration is also important for healing wounds. Movie 20.1 Integrins couple the matrix outside a cell to the cytoskeleton inside it. If cells are to pull on the matrix and crawl over it, they must be able to attach to it. Cells do not attach well to bare collagen. Another extracellular matrix protein, fibronectin, provides a linkage. One part of the fibronectin molecule binds to collagen, while another part forms an attachment site for a cell. Figure 2014a. A cell attaches itself to the specific site in fibronectin by means of a receptor protein, called an integrin, which spans the cell's plasma membrane. While the extracellular domain of the integrin binds to fibronectin, the intracellular domain binds, through a set of adapter molecules, to act in filaments inside the cell. Figure 2014c. Thanks to this anchorage, instead of being ripped out of the flimsy lipid bilayer membrane when there is tension between the cell and the matrix, the integrin molecule transmit that stress to the sturdier cytoskeleton. Integrins do more than passively transmit stress. stress. They also react to stress and to chemical signals from inside and outside the cell that direct them to maintain their attachment to other molecules or to let go. Integrins form and break attachments, for example, as a cell crawls through a tissue, grabbing hold of the matrix at its front end and releasing its grip at the rear. See figure 1732. 
Integrants perform these functions by undergoing remarkable conformational changes. Binding to a molecule on one side of the membrane causes the integrin molecule to stretch out into an extended, activated state so that it can then latch onto another molecule on the opposite side, an effect that operates in both directions across the membrane. Figure 2015. These conformational changes in integrins are used to transmit chemical as well as mechanical signals across the cell membrane. An intracellular signaling molecule can activate the integrin from inside the cell, causing it to reach out and grab hold of an extracellular structure, and binding to an external structure can activate intracellular signaling cascades via protein kinases that associate with the intracellular end of the integrin molecule. In this way, the external attachments that a cell makes help to regulate whether it lives or dies, and, if it does survive, whether it grows, divides, or differentiates. Humans make at least 24 different kinds of integrins, which recognize different extracellular structures and have distinct functions depending on which type of cell they reside in. For example, the integrins on white blood cells help those cells to crawl out of blood vessels at sites of infection so as to deal with the marauding microbes. People who lack this type of integrin develop a disease called leukocyte adhesion deficiency and suffer from repeated bacterial infections. A different form of integrin is found in blood platelets. Individuals who lack this integrin bleed excessively because their platelets cannot bind to the necessary clotting factor in the extracellular matrix. Gels of polysaccharide and protein fill spaces and resist compression. While collagen provides tensile strength to resist stretching, a completely different group of macromolecules in the extracellular matrix of animal tissues provides a complementary function, resisting compression and serving as space fillers. These are the proteoglycans, extracellular proteins linked to a special class of complex negatively charged polysaccharides, the glycosaminoglycans. GAGs. Figure 2016. Proteoglycans are extremely diverse in size, shape, and chemistry. Typically, many GAG chains are attached to a single core protein, which may in turn be linked to one end to another GAG, creating an enormous macromolecule resembling a bottle brush, with a molecular weight in the millions of Daltons. Figure 2017. In dense, Compact connective tissues such as tendon and bone, the proportion of GAGs is small, and the matrix consists almost entirely of collagen, or, in the case of bone, of collagen plus calcium phosphate crystals. At the other extreme, the jelly-like substance in the interior of the eye consists almost enter entirely of one particular type of GAG plus water with only a small amount of collagen. In general, GAGs are strongly hydrophilic and tend to adopt highly extended conformations, which occupy a huge volume relative to their mass. See figure 2017. They form gels even at very low concentrations. Their multiple negative charges attract, attracting a cloud of cations, such as Na+, that are osmotically active, cause large amounts of water to be sucked into the matrix. This creates a swelling pressure that is balanced by tension in the collagen fibers interwoven with the proteoglycans. When the matrix is rich in collagen and large quantities of GAGs are trapped in its meshes, both the swelling pressure and the counterbalancing te tension are enormous. Such a matrix is tough, resilient, and resistant to compression. The cartilage matrix that lines the knee joint, for example, has this character. It can support pressures of hundreds of kilograms per square centimeter. Proteoglycans perform many sophisticated functions in addition to providing hydrated space around cells. They can form gels of varying pore size and change density that act as filters to regulate the passage of molecules through the extracellular medium. They can bind secreted growth factors and other proteins that serve as signals for cells. They can block, encourage, or guide cell migration through the matrix. In all these ways, the matrix components influence the behavior of cells, often the same cells that make the matrix, a reciprocal interaction that has important effects on cell differentiation. Much remains to be learned about how cells weave the tapestry of matrix molecules and how the chemical messages they leave in its fabric are organized and act.
epithelial sheets and cell junctions. There are more than 200 visibly different cell types in the body of a vertebrate. The majority of these are organized into epithelium, singular epithelium, in which the cells are joined together, side to side, to form multicellular sheets. In some cases, the sheet is many cells thick, or stratified, as in the epidermal covering of the skin. In other cases, it is a simple epithelium, only one cell thick, as in the lining of the gut. Epithelial cells can take many forms. They can be tall and, co and columnar, or cuboidal, or squat and squamous, figure 2018. Within a given sheet, they may be all alike or a mixture of different types. Some epithelia, like the skin, act mainly just as a protective barrier. Others have complex biochemical functions. Some secrete specialized products such as hormones, milk, or tears. Others, such as the epithelium lining the gut, absorb nutrients. Yet others detect signals, such as light, sensed by the layer of photoreceptors in the retina of the eye, or sound, sensed by the epithelium containing the auditory hair cells in the ear. Despite these and many other variations, one can recognize a standard set of structural features that virtually all animal epithelia share. The arrangement of cells into epithelia is so commonplace that one easily takes it for granted. Yet it requires a collection of specialized devices, as we shall see, and these are common to a wide variety of different cell types. Epithelia cover the external surface of the body and line all its internal cavities, and they must have been an early feature in the evolution of multicellular animals. Their importance is obvious. Cells joined together into an epithelial sheet create a barrier that has the same significance for the multicellular organism that the plasma membrane has for a single cell. It keeps some molecules in and others out. It takes up nutrients and exports wastes. It contains receptors for environmental signals, and it protects the interior of the organism from invading microorganisms and fluid loss. Epithelial sheets are polarized and rest on a basal lamina. An epithelial sheet has two faces. The apical surface is free and exposed to the air or to a watery fluid. The basal surface rests on some other tissue, usually a connective tissue, to which it is attached. Figure 2019. Supporting the basal surface of the epithelium is a thin, tough sheet of extracellular matrix, called the basal lamina. Figure 2020. Composed of a specialized type of collagen, type 4 collagen, and various other macromolecules. These include a protein called lamin, laminin, which provides adhesive sites for integrin molecules in the plasma membranes of the epithelial cells and thus serves a linking role like that of fibronectin in connective tissues. The apical and basal faces of an epithelium are chemically different, reflecting a polarized internal organization of the individual epithelial cells. Each has a top and a bottom, with different properties. This polarized organization is crucial for epithelial function. Consider, for example, the simple columnar epithelium that lines the small intestine of a mammal. It mainly consists of two intermingled cell types, absorptive cells, which take up nutrients, and goblet cells, so-called because of their shape, which secrete the mucus that protects and lubricates the gut lining. Figure 2021. Both cell types are polarized. The absorptive cells import food molecules from the gut lumen through the apical surface and export these molecules from the basal surface into the underlying tissues. To do this, Absorptive cells require different sets of membrane transport proteins in their apical and basal lamina in their, and basal plasma membranes. See figure 1217. The goblet cells also have to be polarized, but in a different way. They have to synthesize mucus and then discharge it from their apical ends only. See figure 2021. The Golgi apparatus, secretory vesicles, and cytoskeleton are all asymmetrically organized so as to bring this about. This organization depends on the junctions that the epithelial cells form with one another and with the basal lamina. 
which in turn control the arrangement of an elaborate system of membrane-associated intracellular proteins that govern the polarized organization of the cytoplasm. Tight junctions make an epithelium leak-proof and separate its apical and basal surfaces. Epithelial cell junctions can be classified according to their function. Some provide a tight seal to prevent the leakage of molecules across the epithelium through the gaps between its cells. Some provide strong mechanical attachments, and some provide for a special type of intimate chemical communication. In most epithelia, all these types of junctions are present. Figure 2022. Each type of junction is characterized by its own class of membrane proteins that hold the cells together. The sealing function is served in vertebrates by tight junctions. These junctions seal neighboring cells together so that water-soluble molecules cannot easily leak between them. If a tracer molecule is added to one side of an epithelial sheet, it will usually not pass beyond the tight junction. Figure 2023. The tight junction is formed from proteins called claudins and occludins, which are arranged in strands along the lines of junctions to create the seal. Without tight junctions to prevent leakage, the pumping activities of absorptive cells such as those in the gut would be futile, and the composition of the extracellular medium would become the same on both sides of the epithelium. As discussed in Chapter 11, tight junctions also play a key part in maintaining the polarity of the individual epithelial cells in two ways. First, the tight junction around the apical rim of each cell prevents diffusion of membrane proteins within the plasma membrane and so keeps the apical domain of the plasma membrane different from the basal or basolateral domain. See figure 1134. Second, in many epithelia, the tight junctions are sites of assembly for the complexes of intracellular proteins that govern apico-basal polarity in the interior of the cell. Cytoskeleton link junctions bind epithelial cells robustly to one another and to the basal lamina. The junctions that hold an epithelium together by forming mechanical attachments are of three main types. Adherence junctions and desmosomes bind one epithelial cell to another, while hemidesmosomes bind epithelial cells to the basal lamina. All of these junctions provide mechanical strength by the same strategy that we have already encountered in connective tissue. See figure 2014C. The molecule that forms the external adhesion spans the membrane and is linked inside the cell to strong cytoskeletal filaments. In this way, the cytoskeletal filaments are tied into a network that extends from cell to cell across the whole expanse of the epithelial sheet. Adherence junctions and desmosomes are both built around transmembrane proteins that belong to the cadherin family. A cadherin molecule in the plasma membrane of one cell binds directly to an identical cadherin molecule in the plasma membrane of its neighbor. Figure 2024. Such binding of like to like is called homophilic binding. In the case of cadherins, binding also requires that Ca2 plus be present in the extracellular medium hence its name. At an adherence junction, each cadherin molecule is tethered inside its cell, via several linker proteins, to actin filaments. Often, the adherence junctions form a continuous adhesion belt around each of the interacting epithelial cells. This belt is located near the apical end of the cell, just below the tight junctions. Figure 2025. Actin bundles are thus connected from cell to cell across the epithelium. The actin network is potentially contractile, and it gives the epithelial sheet the capacity to develop tension and to change its shape in remarkable ways. By shrinking its apical surface along one axis, the sheet can roll itself up into a tube, figure 2026a. Alternatively, by shrinking its apical surface locally along both axes at once, the sheet can develop a cup-shaped con concavity and eventually create a vesicle that may pinch off from the rest of the epithelium. Epithelial movements such as these are important in embryonic development, where they create structures such as the neural tube, which gives rise to the central nervous system, figure 2026b, and the lens vesicle, which develops into the lens of the eye, figure 2026c. At a desmosome, by contrast, 
a different set of cadherin molecules are anchored inside each cell. These cadherins connect to intermediate filaments, specifically to keratins, which are the type of intermediate filament found in epithelium. Figure 2027. Thick bundles of rope-like keratin filaments crisscross the cytoplasm and are spot-welded via desmosome junctions to the bundles of keratin filaments in adjacent cells. This arrangement confers great tensile strength on the epithelial sheet and is characteristic of tough, exposed epithelia such as the epidermis. Blisters are a painful reminder that it is not enough for epithelial cells to be firmly attached to one another. They must also be anchored to the underlying tissue. As we noted earlier, the anchorage is mediated by integrants in the basal plasma membrane of the epithelial cells. Externally, these integrants bind to the extracellular matrix protein laminin in the basal lamina. Inside the cell, they are linked to keratin filaments, creating a structure that looks superficially like half a desmosome. These attachments of epithelial cells to the extracellular matrix beneath them are therefore called hemidesmosomes. Figure 2028. Gap junctions allow ions and small molecules to pass from cell to cell. The final type of epithelial cell junction, found in virtually all epithelia and in many other types of tissues, serves a totally different purpose. It is called a gap junction. In the electron microscope, it appears as a region where the membranes of two cells lie close together and exactly parallel, with a very narrow gap of 2 to 4 nanometers between them. Figure 2029a. The gap is not empty, but is spanned by the protruding ends of many identical protein complexes that lie in the plasma membranes of the two opposed cells. These complexes, called connexons, form channels across the two plasma membranes and are aligned end-to-end -end so as to create narrow passageways that allow inorganic ions and small water-soluble solu molecules up to a molecular mass of about 1,000 daltons to move directly from the cytosol of one cell to the cytosol of another, figure 2029b. This creates an electrical and a metabolic coupling between the cells. Gap junctions between heart muscle cells, for example, provide the electrical coupling that allows electrical waves of excitation to spread through the tissue. These waves of excitation trigger the coordinated contraction of the cells, thus producing a regular heartbeat. Gap junctions in many tissues can be opened or closed as needed in response to extracellular signals. The neurotransmitter dopamine, for example, reduces gap junction communication within a class of neurons in the retina in response to an increase in light intensity. Figure 2030. This reduction in gap junction permeability changes the pattern of electrical signaling and helps the retina switch from using rod photoreceptors, which are good detectors in lo of low light, to cone photoreceptors, which detect color and fine detail in bright light. Curiously, plant tissues, although they lack all the other types of cell junctions we have described earlier, have a functional counterpart of the gap junction. The cytoplasms of adjacent plant cells are connected via minute communicating channels called plasmodesmata, which span the intervening cell walls. Figure 2031. In contrast to gap junctional channels, plasmodesmata are cytoplasmic channels lined with plasma membrane, and thus in plants the cytoplasm is, in principle, continuous from one cell to the next. Ions, small molecules, and even macromolecules such as some proteins and microRNAs can pass through plasmodesmata, and the regulated traffic of transcription regulators from one cell to another is important in plant development. Tissue Maintenance and Renewal One cannot contemplate the organization of tissues without wondering how these astonishingly patterned structures come into being. This raises one of the most ancient and fundamental questions in all of biology. How is a whole multicellular organism generated from a single fertilized egg? In the process of development, the egg cell divides repeatedly to give a clone of cells. About uh, what's that? 10 trillion of them for a human being, all containing the same genome but specialized in different ways. This clone has a structure. It may take the form of a daisy or an oak tree, a sea urchin, a whale, or a mouse. Figure 2032. 
The structure is determined by the genome of the egg that the egg contains. The linear sequence of A, G, C, and T nucleotides in a DNA directs the production of a host of distinct cell types, each expressing different sets of genes and arranged in a precise, intricate, three-dimensional pattern. Although the final structure of an animal's body may be enormously complex, it is generated by a limited repertoire of cell activities. Examples of all these activities have been discussed in earlier pages of this book. Cells grow, divide, and die. They form mechanical attachments and generate forces per movement, for movement. They differentiate by switching on or off the production of specific sets of proteins. They produce molecular signals to influence neighboring cells, and they respond to signals that neighboring cells deliver to them. They remember the effects of previous signals they have received, and so progressively become more and more specialized in the characteristics they adopt. The genome, identical in every cell, defines the rules according to which these various possible cell activities are called into play. Through its operation in each cell individually, the genome guides the whole intricate process by which a multicellular organism is generated from a fertilized egg. Movies 1.1, 20.3, and 20.4 offer some visual examples of how development unfurls from the embryos of a frog, a fruit fly, and a zebrafish, respectively. For developmental biologists, the challenge is to explain in these terms the entire sequence of interlocking events that lead from the egg to the adult organism. We shall not attempt to set out an answer to this problem here. We do not have the space to do it justice, even though a great deal of the process is now understood. But the same basic activities that combine to create the organism during development continue even in the adult body where fresh cells are continually generated in precisely controlled patterns. It is this more limited topic that we discuss in this section, focusing on the organization and maintenance of the tissues of vertebrates. Tissues are organized mixtures of many cell types. Although the specialized tissues in our body differ in many ways, they all have certain basic requirements, usually provided for by a mixture of cell types as illustrated for the skin in figure 2033. As discussed earlier in this chapter, all tissues need mechanical strength, which is often supplied by a supporting bed or framework of connective tissue inhabited by fibroblasts. In this connective tissue, blood vessels lined with endothelial cells satisfy the need for oxygen, nutrients, and waste disposal. Likewise, most tissues are innervated by nerve cell axons, which are ensheathed by Schwann cells that provide electrical insulation. Macrophages dispose of dying cells and other unwanted debris, and lymphocytes and other white blood cells combat infection. Most of these cell types originate outside the tissue and invade it. Either early in the course of its development, endothelial cells, nerve cell axons, and Schwann cells, or continually during life, macrophages and other white blood cells. This complex supporting apparatus is required to maintain the principal specialized cells of the tissue, the contractile cells of muscle, the secretory cells of glands, or the blood-forming cells of bone marrow, for example. Almost every tissue is therefore an intricate mixture of many cell types that must remain different from one another while coexisting in the same environment. Moreover, in almost all adult tissues, cells are continually dying and being replaced. Throughout this hurly-burly of cell replacement and tissue renewal, the organization of the tissue must be preserved. Three main factors contribute to this stability. Figure 2034. 1. Cell communication. Each type of specialized cell continually monitors its environment for signals from other cells and adjusts its behavior accordingly. In fact, the very survival of most cells depends on such social signals, discussed in Chapter 16. These communications ensure that new cells are produced and survive only when and where they are required. 2. Selective cell-cell adhesion. Because different cell types have different cadherins and other adhesion molecules in their plasma membrane, they tend to stick selectively, by homophilic binding, to other cells of the same type. They may also form selective attachments to certain other cell types or to specific extracellular matrix components. The cell activity of adhesion prevents the different cell types in the tissue from becoming chaotically mixed. 3. Cell memory. As discussed in Chapter 8, 
specialized patterns of gene expression evoked by signals that act during embryonic development are afterwards stably maintained, so that cells aut autonomously preserve their distinctive character and pass it on to their progeny. A fibroblast divides to produce more fibroblasts, an endothelial cell divides to produce more endothelial cells, and so on. This principle, with elaborations that we explain later, preserves the diversity of cell types in the tissue. Different tissues are renewed at different rates. Cells and tissues vary enormously in their rate and pattern of turnover. At one extreme are nerve cells, most of which last a lifetime without replacement. At the other extreme are the cells that line the intestine, which are replaced every few days. Between these extremes, there is a spectrum of different rates and styles of cell replacement and tissue renewal. Bone, for example, has a turnover time of about 10 years in humans involving renewal of the matrix as well as of cells, old bone matrix is slowly eaten away by a set of cells called osteoclasts, akin to macrophages, while new matrix is deposited by another set of cells, osteoblasts, akin to fibroblasts. New red blood cells in humans are continually generated in the bone marrow, from yet another class of cells, and released into the circulation from which they are removed and destroyed after 120 days. In the skin, the outer layers of the epidermis are continually flaking off and being replaced from below, so that the epidermis is renewed with a turnover time of about two months, and so on. Our life depends on these renewal processes. A large dose of ionizing radiation blocks cell division and thus halts renewal. Within a few days, the lining of the intestine, for example, becomes denuded of cells, leading to the devastating diarrhea and water loss characteristic of acute radiation sickness. Clearly, there have to be control mechanisms to keep cell production and cell loss in balance in a normal, healthy adult body. Cancers originate through violation of these controls, allowing cells in the self-renewing tissues to proliferate to excess. To understand cancer, therefore, it is important to understand the normal processes of tissue renewal that cancer perverts. Stem cells generate a continuous supply of terminally differentiated cells. Many of the differentiated cells that need continual replacement are themselves unable to divide. Red blood cells, surface epidermal cells, and the absorptive and goblet cells of the gut lining are all of this type. Such cells are referred to as terminally differentiated. They lie at the dead end of their developmental pathway. Replacements for terminally differentiated cells are generated from a stock of proliferating precursor cells, which themselves usually derive from small numbers of dividing stem cells. Both stem cells and proliferating precursor cells are retained in the corresponding tissues along with the differentiated cells. Stem cells are not terminally differentiated and can divide without limit, or at least for the lifetime of the animal. When a stem cell divides, though, each daughter has a choice. Either it can remain a stem cell, or it can embark on a course leading irreversibly to terminal differentiation, usually via a series of precursor cell divisions. Figure 2035. The job of the stem cell and precursor cells therefore, is not to carry out the specialized function of the differentiated cell, but rather to produce cells that will. Stem cells are usually present in small numbers and often have a nondescript appearance, making them difficult to identify. Although they are not terminally differentiated, stem cells of adult tissues are nonetheless specialized. Under normal conditions, they stably express sets of transcription regulators that ensure that their differentiated progeny will be of the appropriate types. The pattern of cell replacement varies from one stem cell-based tissue to another. In the lining of the small intestine, for example, the absorptive and secretory cells, mucus-producing goblet cells, as well as some other secretory cell types, together are arranged as a single-layered, simple epithelium covering the surfaces of the finger-like villi that project into the gut lumen. This epithelium is continuous with the epithelium lining the crypts that descend into the underlying connective tissue. The stem cells lie near the bottom of the crypts. 
Newborn absorptive and secretory cells generated from stem cells begin to differentiate in the crypts. Most of these differentiated cells are carried upward by a sliding movement in the plane of the epithelial sheet until they reach the exposed surfaces of the villi. At the tips of the villi, the cells die and are shed into the gut. Figure 2036. A contrasting example is found in the epidermis. The epidermis is a stratified epithelium with stem cells and precursor cells in the basal layer, adhering to the basal lamina. The differentiating cells travel outward from their site of origin in a direction perpendicular to the plane of the cell sheet. Figure 2037. Often, a single type of stem cell gives rise to several types of differentiated progeny. The stem cells of the intestine, for example, produce absorptive cells, goblet cells, and several other secretory cell types. The process of blood cell formation, or hemopoiesis, provides an extreme example of this phenomenon. All of the different cell types in the blood, both the red blood cells that carry oxygen and the many types of white blood cells that fight infection, figure 2038, ultimately derived from a shared hemopoietic stem cell found in the bone marrow. Figure 2039. Specific signals maintain the stem cell populations. Every stem cell system requires, a control requires control mechanisms to ensure that new cells are generated in the appropriate places and in the right quantities. The controls depend on molecular signals exchanged between the stem cells, their progeny, and the surrounding tissues. These signals and the biochemical pathways through which they act fall into a surprisingly small number of families corresponding to half a dozen basic signaling mechanisms, some of which we have discussed in length in Chapter 16. These few mechanisms are used again and again, in the embryo and in the adult, in different combinations, and evoking different responses in different contexts. Almost all these families of signaling mechanisms contribute to the task of maintaining the complex organization of a stem cell system, such as that of the intestine. Thus, a class of signal molecules, known as the WNT proteins, serve to keep the stem cells and precursor cells at the base of each intestinal crypt in a proliferative state. The cells in these regions both secrete WNT proteins and express the receptors for these proteins, and, apparently through positive feedback, they stimulate themselves to continue dividing. Figure 2040. At the same time, these cells produce other signals which act as longer range to prevent activation of the WNT pathways outside the crypts. The cells within the crypt exchange yet, another, yet other signals with one another to control their diversification, so that some differentiate into secretory cells while other become absorptive cells. Disorders of these signaling mechanisms disrupt the structure of the gut lining. In particular, as we see later, Defects in the regulation of WNT signaling underlie the commonest form of human intestinal cancer. Stem cells can be used to repair damaged tissues. Because stem cells proliferate indefinitely and produce differentiated progeny, they provide for both continual renewal of normal tissue and repair of tissue, through lo tissue loss through injury. For example, by transfusing a few hemopoietic stem cells into a mouse, whose own blood stem cells have been destroyed by irradiation, it is possible to fully repopulate the animal with a new blood cells and rescue it from death by anemia, infection, or both. A similar approach is used in the treatment of human leukemia with irradiation, or cytotoxic drugs, followed by bone marrow transplantation. Stem cells taken directly from adult tissues hold promise for use in tissue repair, but another type of stem cell, first identified through experiments in mice, may have even greater potential. It is possible, through cell culture, to derive from early mouse embryos an extraordinarily class of stem cells called embryonic stem cells, or ES cells. Under appropriate conditions, these cells can be kept proliferating indefinitely in culture and yet retain unrestricted developmental potential and are thus said to be pluripotent. If the cells from the culture dish are put back into an early embryo, they can give rise to all the tissues and cell types in the body, including germ cells. Figure 2041. Their descendants in the embryo are able to integrate perfectly into whatever site they come to occupy, 
adopting the character and behavior that normal cells would show at that site. Cells with properties similar, similar to those of mouse ES cells can now be derived from early human embryos, creating a potentially inexhaustible supply of cells that might be used for the replacement and repair of mature human tissues that are damaged. For example, experiments in mice suggest that it should be possible to use ES cells to replace the skeletal muscle fibers that degenerate in victims of muscular dystrophy. The nerve cells that die in patients with Parkinson's disease, the insulin secreting cells that are destroyed in type 1 diabetics, and the cardiac muscle cells that die during a heart attack. Perhaps one day it might even become possible to grow entire organs from ES cells by a recapitulation of embryonic development. There are, however, many hurdles to be cleared before such dreams can become reality. One major problem concerns immune rejection. If the transplanted cells are genetically different from the cells of the patient into whom they are grafted, they are likely to be rejected and destroyed by the immune system. A possible way around this problem is to use a strategy known colloquially as therapeutic cloning, as we explain next. Therapeutic cloning could provide a way to generate personalized ES cells. The term cloning has been used in confusing ways as a shorthand term for several quite distinct types of procedure, particularly in public debates about the ethics of stem cell research. It is important to understand the distinctions. As biologists define the term, a clone is simply a set of individuals that are genetically identical by virtue of their descent from a single ancestor. The simplest type of cloning is the cloning of cells. Thus, one can take a single epidermal stem cell from the skin and let it grow and divide in culture to obtain a large clone of genetically identical epidermal cells, which can, for example, be used to help reconstruct the skin of a badly burned patient. This kind of cloning is no more than an extension by artificial means of the processes of cell proliferation and repair that occur in a normal human body. The cloning of entire multicellular animals, called reproductive cloning, is a very different enterprise, involving far more radical departure from the ordinary course of nature. As we discuss in Chapter 19, each individual animal normally has both a mother and a father and is not genetically identical to either of them. In reproductive cloning, the need for two parents and sexual union is bypassed. For mammals, this difficult feat has been achieved in mice and sheep and some other domestic animals by a technique called nuclear transplantation. The procedure begins with an unfertilized egg cell. The nucleus of this haploid gamete cell is sucked out, and in its place a nucleus from a regular diploid cell is introduced. The diploid donor cell can, for example, be taken from a tissue of an adult individual. The hybrid cell consisting of a diploid donor nucleus in a host egg cytoplasm, is allowed to develop for a short while in culture. In a small proportion of cases, this can give rise to an early embryo, which is then put into the uterus of a foster mother. Figure 2042. If the experimenter is lucky, development continues as it would in a normal embryo, eventually giving rise to a whole new animal. An individual produced in this way, by reproductive cloning, should be genetically identical to the adult individual who donated the diploid cell, except for the small amount of genetic information in mitochondria which are inherited with the egg cytoplasm. Another procedure, different again from the ones just outlined, uses the technique of nuclear transplantation to produce cultured ES cells. See figure 2042. In this case, the cell that has received the transplanted nucleus is allowed to undergo the earliest steps of development, giving rise to a ver very early embryo, consisting of about 200 cells. But this embryo is not transferred to the uterus of a foster mother. Instead, it is used as a source from which ES cells are derived in culture, with the aim of generating various cell types that can be used for tissue repair. This so-called therapeutic cloning is an elaborate technique for generating personalized ES cells, rather than whole cloned animals. Because the cells obtained by this route are genetically identical to the original donor cell, they can be grafted back into the adult from whom the donor tissue was taken, without fear of immunological rejection. Nuclear transplantation is technically very difficult, and it has not yet been, successfully, yet been successful in human egg cells. 
The procedure requires a supply of human egg cells, which would have to be obtained from women donors, and it raises serious ethical problems. Indeed, nuclear transplantation into human egg cells is outlawed in some countries. These ethical problems can be bypassed by a recent alternative approach, in which cells are taken from an adult tissue, grown in culture, and reprogrammed into an ES-like state by artificially introducing a specific set of genes, using genetically manipulated viruses as vectors. Investigators have found that expression of a set of just three genes, called OCT34, SOX2, and KLF4, is sufficient to convert fibroblasts into cells with practically all the properties of ES cells, including the ability to differentiate in diverse ways and to contribute to any tissue. Figure 2043. These ES-like cells are called induced pluripotent stem cells, IPS cells. The conversion rate is slow, is low, however. Only a small proportion of the fibroblasts make the switch. And there, are various, and there are serious worries about the safety of implanting derivatives of such virus-infected cells into patients. Much work remains to be done before this approach can be used to treat human diseases. Meanwhile, however, human ES cells and especially human IPS cells promise to be immediately valuable in other ways. They can be used to generate large homogeneous populations of differentiated cells of a specific type in culture. These can serve for testing the effects of large numbers of chemical compounds in the search for new drugs with useful action, actions on a given human cell type. Moreover, it is possible to create IPS cells containing the genomes of patients who suffer from a given genetic disease, and to use these patient-specific stem cells for the discovery of drugs useful in the treatment of that disease. Such cells will be valuable for analysis of the disease mechanism, and at a basic level, Manipulations of ES and IPS cells in culture should help us fathom some of the many unsolved mysteries of stem cell biology. Cancer We pay a price for having bodies that can renew and repair themselves. The, delicate adjusted, the delicately adjusted mechanism that controls these processes can go wrong, leading to catastrophic disruption of the body structure. Foremost among the diseases of tissue renewal is cancer which stands alongside infectious illness, malnutrition, war, and heart disease as a major cause of death among humans. In Europe and North America, for example, one in four of us will die of cancer. Cancers arise from violations of the basic rules of social cell behavior. To make sense of the origins and, prog and progress of the disease, and to devise treatments, we have to draw upon almost every part of our knowledge of how cells work and interact with tissues. Conversely, much of what we know about cell and tissue biology has been discovered as a byproduct of cancer research. In this section, we examine the causes and mechanisms of cancer, the types of cell misbehavior that contribute to its progress, and the ways in which we hope to, to use our understanding to defeat these misbehaving cells and hence the disease. Cancer cells proliferate, invade, and metastasize. In order to be maintained as the tissues of the body grow and renew themselves, the individual cell must adjust its behavior according to the needs of the organism as a whole. The cell must divide when new cells of its specific type are needed, and refrain from dividing when they are not. It must live as long as it is required to live, and kill itself when it is required to die. It must maintain its appropriate specialized character and it must occupy its proper place and not stray into appropriate territories. Of course, in a large organism, no significant harm is done if an occasional single cell misbehaves, but a potentially devastating breakdown of control occurs when a single cell suffers a genetic alteration that allows it to survive and divide when it should not, producing daughter cells that behave in the same asocial way. The organization of the tissue, and eventually that of the body as a whole, may then become disrupted by a relentlessly expanding clone of an abnormal cells. It is, this it is this catastrophe that happens in cancer. Cancer cells are defined by two heritable properties, they and their progeny. 1. Proliferate in defiance of the normal constraints, and 2. Invade and colonize territories normally reserved for other cells. Movie 20.7 
It is a combination of these features that creates the lethal danger. Cells that have the first property but not the second proliferate excessively but remain clustered together in a single mass, forming a tumor. But the tumor in this case is said to be benign, and it can usually be removed cleanly and completely by surgery. A tumor is cancerous only if its cells have, to be, have the ability to invade surrounding tissue, in which case the tumor is said to be malignant. Malignant tumor cells with this invasive property can break loose from the primary tumor, enter the bloodstream or lymphatic vessels, and form secondary tumors, metastases, at other sites in the body. Figure 2044. The more widely the cancer spreads, the harder it becomes to eradicate. Epidemiology identifies preventable causes of cancer. Prevention is always better than a cure, but to prevent cancer we need to know what causes it. Do factors in our environment or features of our way of life trigger the disease and help it to progress? If so, what are they? Answers to these questions come mainly from epidemiology, the statistical analysis of human populations that is used to look for factors that correlate with disease incidence. This approach has provided strong evidence that the environment plays a part in the causation of most cases of cancer. The types of cancers that are common, for example, vary from country to country, and studies of migrants show that it is usually where people live rather than when they are than where they are than where they were born that governs their cancer risk. Although it is still hard to discover which specific factors in the environment or lifestyle are significant, and many remain unknown. Some have been identified quite precisely. Thus, it was noted long ago that cervical cancer arising in the epithelium lining the cervix, neck, of the uterus was much commoner in married women than in single women. This pointed to a cause related to sexual activity. We now know through modern epidemiology epidemiological studies that most cases of cervical cancer involve infection of the cervical epithelium with certain subtypes of a common virus called human papilloma virus. This is transmitted through sexual intercourse and can sometimes, if one is unlucky, provoke uncontrolled proliferation of the infected cells. Knowing this, we can attempt to prevent the cancer by preventing the infection, for example, by vaccination against papilloma virus. Such a vaccine is now available, conferring a high level of protection if given to girls when they are young, before they become sexually active. If the gr in the great majority of human cancers, however, viruses do not appear to play a part. Cancer is not an infectious disease, but epidemiology reveals other factors. Obesity, for example, is correlated with an increased cancer risk, and the relationship is suspected to be causal. By far, the most important environmental cause of cancer in the modern world, however, is tobacco smoking, which is not only responsible for almost all cases of lung cancer, but also raises the incidence of several other cancers, such as those of the bladder. If we could stop the use of tobacco, it is estimated that we could prevent about 30% of all cancer deaths. No other single policy or treatment is known that would have such an impact on the cancer death rate. As we explained below, Although environmental factors affect the incidence of cancer and are critical for some forms of the disease, it would be wrong to conclude that they are the fundamental cause of cancers in general. No matter how hard we try to prevent cancer by healthy living, we will never be able to eradicate it entirely. We will always be confronted with cases that demand treatment. To devise treatments that will succeed, we need to understand the biology of cancer cells and the mechanisms that underlie the growth and spread of tumors. Cancers develop by an accumulation of mutations. Cancer is fundamentally a genetic disease. It arises as a consequence of pathological changes in the information carried by DNA. It differs from other genetic diseases in that the mutations underlying cancer are mainly somatic mutations, those that occur in individual cells of the mature body, as opposed to germline mutations, which are handed down via the germ cells from which the entire multicellular organism develops. Most of the identified agents known to contribute to the causation of cancer, including ionizing radiation and most chemical carcinogens, are mutagens. They cause changes in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. But even in an environment that is free of tobacco smoke, radioactivity, and, uh, and all the other external mutagens that worry us, 
mutations will occur spontaneously as a result of fundamental limit limitations on the accuracy of DNA replication and DNA repair, discussed in Chapter 6. In fact, environmental carcinogens other than tobacco probably account for only a small fraction of the mutations responsible for cancer, and elimination of all these external risk factors would still leave us prone to the disease. Although DNA is replicated and repaired with great accuracy, on average of one mistake slips for every 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 nucleotides copied, as we discuss in Chapter 6, this means that spontaneous mutations occur at an estimated rate of about 10 to the negative 6 or 10 to the negative 7 mutations per gene per cell division, even without encouragement by external mutagens. About 10 to the 16 cell divisions take place in a human body in the course of a lifetime. Thus, every single gene is likely to have undergone mutation on more than 10 to the 9 separate occasions in any individual. From this point of view, the problem of cancer seems not to be why it occurs, but why it occurs so infrequently. The explanation is that it takes more than a single, single mutation to turn a normal cell into a cancer cell. Precisely how many mutations are required is still a matter of debate, but it is certainly more than two or three. These mutations do not all occur at once, but sequentially, usually over a period of many years. Cancer, therefore, is often a disease of old age because it takes a long time for an individual line of cells to accumulate a large number of mutations. See figure 620. In fact, most human cancer cells not only contain many mutations, but also are genetically unstable. This genetic instability results from mutations that interfere with the accurate replication and maintenance of the genome, and thereby increase the mutation rate itself. Sometimes, the increased mutation rate may result from a def defect in one of the many proteins needed to repair damaged DNA and to correct errors in DNA replication. Sometimes there may be a defect in the checkpoint mechanisms that normally prevent a cell with damaged DNA from attempting to divide before it has completed a repair, discussed in Chapter 18. Sometimes there may be a fault in the machinery of mitosis. The consequences of these defects in the way the cancer cell handles its DNA are often manifested in chromosome breaks and rearrangements, resulting in a grossly abnormal and unstable karyotype. Figure 2045. Cancer cells evolve properties that give them a competitive advantage. The mutations that lead to cancer do not cripple the mutant cells. On the contrary, they give these cells a competitive advantage over their neighbors. It is this advantage enjoyed by the mutant cells that leads to disaster for the organism as a whole. Natural selection favors cells carrying mutations that enhance cell proliferation and cell survival, regardless of the effects on neighbors and this process culminates in the genesis of cancer cells that run riot, run riot within the population of cells that form the body, upsetting its regular structure. As an initial population of mutant cells grows, it slowly evolves. New chance mutations occur in the member cells, and some of these mutations are favored by natural selection. Figure 2046. Non-mutagenic environmental or lifestyle factors such as obesity may favor the development of cancer by altering the selection pressures that operate in the tissues of the body. Circulating nutrients or horm hormones, for example, may help cells with dangerous mutations to survive and proliferate. Eventually, cells emerge that have all the abnormalities required for full-blown cancer. To be successful, a cancer cell must acquire a whole range of abnormal properties a collection of subversive new skills. An epithelial stem cell in the lining of the gut, for example, must undergo changes that permit it to carry on dividing when it should stop. That cell and its progeny must be able to displace their normal neighbors and to attract a blood supply to nourish continued tumor growth. For these cells to then become invasive, they must acquire the ability to digest their way through the basal lamina of the epithelium to the underlying tissue. To spread to other tissues, an ability known as metastasis. They must be able to get in and out of the blood or lymph circulation and settle and survive in new sites. See figure 2044. Different cancers require different combinations of properties. Nevertheless, we can draw up a, gen a general list of key behaviors of cancer cells that distinguish them from normal cells. 1. 
they have a reduced dependence on signals from other cells for their growth, survival, and division. Often, this is because they contain mutations in components of the cell signaling pathways through which cells respond to such social cues. A mutation in a ROS gene, discussed in Chapter 16, for example, can cause an intracellular signal pr for proliferation to be produced even, even in the absence of the extracellular signal that would normally be needed to trigger it, like a faulty doorbell that rings even when nobody is pressing the button. 2. Cancer cells are less prone than normal cells to kill themselves by apoptosis. This aversion to suicide is often caused by mutations in genes that regulate the intracellular death program responsible for apoptosis, discussed in Chapter 18. For example, about 50% of all human cancers have lost or suffered a mutation in the p53 gene. The p53 protein normally acts as part of a checkpoint mechanism that causes cells either to cease dividing, see figure 1813, or to die by apoptosis, when their DNA is damaged. Chromosome breakage, for example, if not repaired, will generally, generally cause a cell to commit suicide. But if the cell is defective in p53, it may survive and divide, creating highly abnormal daughter cells that can become more malignant. 3. Unlike most normal human cells, cancer cells can often proliferate indefinitely. Most normal human somatic cells will only divide a limited number of times in culture, after which they permanently stop, apparently because these cells do not produce the enzyme telomerase, so the telomeres on the ends of their chromosomes become too short. See page 210. Cancer cells typically break through this barrier by reactivating production of the telomerase enzyme that maintains telomere length. 4. Most cancer cells, as noted above, are genetically unstable, with a greatly increased mutation rate. 5. Cancer cells are abnormally invasive, and this is often in part because they lack specific cell adhesion molecules, such as cadherins, that hold normal cells in their proper place. 6. Cancer cells can often survive and proliferate in foreign tissues to form secondary tumors, metastases, whereas most normal cells die when misplaced. We still do not understand precisely what molecular changes are needed to confer this ability. To understand the molecular biology of cancer, we have to be able to identify the mutations that give rise to these abnormal forms of behavior. Many diverse types of genes are critical for cancer. A great variety of approaches have been used to track down the genes and mutations that are critical for cancer. Though many of the most important of these genes have been identified, the hunt for others continues. In some cases, the dangerous mutations are ones that make the affected gene product hyperactive. These mutations have a dominant effect. Only one gene copy needs to be mutated to cause trouble. The resulting mutant gene is called an oncogene, figure 2047a. The corresponding normal form of the gene is called a proto-oncogene. Figure 2048 shows a variety of ways in which the conversion from proto-oncogene to oncogene can occur. For other genes, the danger lies in mutations that destroy gene function. These mutations are generally recessive. Both gene copies must be lost or inactivated before an effect is seen. The affected gene is called a tumor suppressor gene. See figure 2047b. Tumor suppressor genes were first identified by studies of human genetics. Occasionally, individuals are encountered who have inherited a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene. Although one gene copy is enough for normal cell behavior, the cells of these individuals are only, mutational, are only one mutational step away from the total loss of the gene's function, as compared to two steps away from a normal person. Because the number of additional mutations required for cancer is smaller, the disease occurs with higher frequency and on average at an earlier er age, sometimes in childhood. The families that carry such mutations are therefore unusually prone to cancer. Proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes are of many sorts, corresponding to the many different kinds of misbehavior that cancer cells display. Some of these genes code for growth factors, for receptors, or, like ROS, for components of the intracellular signaling pathways that growth factors activate. Other 
code, others code for DNA repair proteins for mediators of the DNA damage response such as p53 or for regulators of the cell cycle or of apoptosis. Still others, as we have mentioned, code for cell adhesion molecules such as cadherins. Figure 2049 conveys some idea of this diversity. Colorectal cancer illustrates how loss of a gene can lead to growth of a tumor. Colorectal cancer provides a well-studied example to show first how a tumor suppressor gene can be identified and second, how its identification leads on to an understanding of a basic molecular mechanism underlying the growth of a common type of tumor. Colorectal cancer arises from the epithelium lining the colon and rectum. Most cases are seen in old people and do not have any discernible hereditary cause. A small proportion of cases, however, occur in families that are exceptionally prone to the disease and show an unusually early onset. In one set of families, the predisposition to cancer has been traced to an inherited mutation in a DNA repair enzyme as discussed in Chapter 6. In another class of hereditary colorectal cancer patients, a different mutation is present, leading to a highly distinctive phenotype. The affected individuals develop colorectal cancer in early adult life, and the onset of their disease is foreshadowed by the development of hundreds or thousands of little tumorous growths, called polyps, in the lining of the colon and rectum. Through family studies, the abnormality can be traced to deletion or inactivation of a gene called the adenomatous polypopsis coli, APC gene. Affected individuals inherit one mutant copy of the gene and one normal copy. Their cancers arise from cells that can be shown to have undergone a somatic mutation that inactivates the remaining good copy. But what about the great majority of colorectal cancer patients who have inherited two good copies of APC and do not have the hereditary condition or any significant family history of cancer? When their tumors are analyzed, it turns out that in more than 60% of cases, although both copies of APC are present in the adjacent normal tissue, the tumor cells themselves have lost both copies of the gene, presumably through two independent somatic mutations. As all this clearly identifies APC as a tumor suppressor gene, and knowing its sequence and mutant phenotype, one can begin to decipher how its loss helps to initiate the development of cancer. As explained in How We Know, pages 725 to 726, the APC gene was found to encode an inhibitory protein that normally restricts the activation of the WNT signaling pathway, which is involved in stimulating cell proliferation in the crypts of the gut lining as described earlier. When APC is lost, the pathway is hyperactive and epithelial cells proliferate to excess, generating a polyp. Figure 2051. Within this growing mass of tissue, further mutations may occur, resulting in invasive cancer. Figure 2052. An understanding of cancer cell biology opens the way to new treatments. The better we understand the tricks that cancer cells use to survive, proliferate, and spread, the better are our chances of finding ways to defeat them. The task is hard because cancer cells are mutable and, like weeds or parasites, rapidly evolve resistance to treatments used to exterminate them. Moreover, because mutations arise randomly, each case of each variety of cancer is liable to have its own unique combination of genes mutated. Thus, no single treatment is likely to work in every patient. Moreover, Cancers generally are not detected until the primary tumor has reached a diameter of one centimeter or more, by which time it consists of hundreds of millions of cells that are already genetically diverse and often have already begun to metastasize. Figure 2053. In spite of the difficulties, many cancers can be treated effectively, and the future prospects for more and better treatments are bright. Surgery remains the most effective tactic, and surgical techniques are continually improving. In many cases, if a cancer has not spread far, it can often be cured by simply cutting it out. Where surgery fails, therapies based on the intrinsic peculiarities of cancer cells can be used. Lack of normal checkpoint mechanisms, for example, may help to make cancer cells particularly vulnerable to DNA damage, whereas a normal cell will halt its proliferation until damage is repaired. A cancer cell may charge ahead regardless. 
producing daughter cells that may die because they inherit a broken, incomplete set of chromosomes. Presumably for this reason, cancer cells can often be killed by doses of radiotherapy or DNA damaging chemotherapy that leave adjacent normal cells relatively unharmed. These treatments are long established, but many novel approaches are also being enthusiastically pursued. In some cases, as with loss of, of checkpoints, the very feature that helps to make the cancer cell dangerous also makes it vulnerable, enabling us to kill it with a properly targeted treatment. Some cancers of the breast and ovary, for example, owe their genetic instability to the lack of protein uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2 needed for accurate repair of double-stranded breaks in DNA, discussed in Chapter 6. The cancer cells survive by relying on other machinery that provides alternative types of DNA repair. A drug that inhibits one of these alternative DNA repair pathways kills the cancer cells by raising their genetic instability to such a level that the cells die from chromosome fragmentation when they attempt to divide. Normal cells, which have intact double-strand break repair machinery, are relatively unaffected and the drug seems to have a few side effects. To have few side effects. Another promising strategy is to block formation of the new blood vessels that normally invade a growing tumor. Movie 20.8 This approach should choke tumor growth by depriving the cells of their blood supply. Yet another set of strategies aims in various ways to use the immune system to kill the tumor cells, taking advantage of tumor-specific cell surface molecules to target the attack. Vaccination with tumor-specific molecules can stimulate the patient's own immune system to turn against the tumor, or antibodies against these tumor molecules can be produced in vitro and injected into the patient to mark the tumor cells for destruction. In some cancers, it is becoming possible to target the products of specific oncogenes directly so as to block their harmful action. In chronic myeloid leukemia, CML, the misbehavior of the cancerous cells is known to depend on a mutant signaling protein, a tyrosine protein kinase, that causes the cells to proliferate when they should not. A small drug molecule called Gleevec has been designed to block the activity of this kinase. Figure 2054. Their results have been a dramatic su success. In many patients, the abnormal proliferation and survival of the leukemic cells is strongly inhibited and prolonged remission of symptoms is achieved. The same drug is effective in some other cancers containing similar oncogenes. With these examples before us, we can hope that soon, equipped with our modern understanding of the molecular biology of cancer, it will be possible to devise effective rational methods of treatment for a still wider range of forms of the disease. Conversely, the focus on cancer has taught us many important lessons about basic molecular biology. The applications of that knowledge go far beyond the treatment of cancer, for the knowledge gives us insight into the way the whole living world works. Essential Concepts Tissues are composed of cells plus extracellular matrix. In plants, each cell surrounds itself with extracellular matrix in the form of a cell wall made chiefly of cellulose and other polysaccharides. Naked plant cells are fragile but can exert an osmotic swelling pressure on the enveloping wall to keep the tissue to which they belong turgid. Cellulose fibers in the plant cell wall confer tensile strength. Other cell wall components give resistance to compression. The orientation in which cellulose is deposited controls the orientation of plant growth. Animal connective tissues provide mechanical support and consist of extracellular matrix with sparsely scattered cells. The protein and polysaccharide components of the matrix are made by the connective tissue cells embedded in it. In most connective tissues, these cells are called fibroblasts. In the extracellular matrix of animals, tensile strength is provided by the fibrous protein collagen. Transmembrane integrin proteins link extracellular matrix proteins such as collagen and fibronectin to the intracellular cytoskeleton. Glycosaminoglycans, GAGs, covalently link to proteins to form proteoglycans, act as space fillers in the extracellular matrix and provide resistance to compression. Cells join together in epithelial sheets line all external and internal surfaces of the animal body. In epithelial sheets, in contrast to connective tissues, tension is transmitted directly from cell to cell via cell-cell junctions. 
Proteins of the cadherin family span the epithelial cell membrane and bind to similar cadherins in the adjacent epithelial cell. At an adherence junction, the cadherins are linked intracellularly to actin filaments. As a desmosome junction, they are linked to keratin filaments. Actin bundles connected from cell to cell across an epithelium can contract, causing the epithelium to bend. Hemidesmosomes attach the basal face of an epithelial cell to the basal lamina, a specialized seat of ex sheet of extracellular matrix. Tight junctions seal one epithelial cell to the next, barring the diffusion of water-soluble molecules across the epithelium. Gap junctions form channels that allow the passage of small molecules and ions from cell to cell. Plasmodesmata in plants have the same function but a different structure. Most tissues and vertebrates are complex mixtures of cell types that are subject to continual turnover. The structure of the adult organism is maintained and renewed by the same basic processes that generated it in the embryo, cell proliferation, cell movement, and cell differentiation. As in the embryo, these processes are controlled by cell communication, selective cell adhesion, and cell memory. New terminally differentiated cells are generated from stem cells, usually via the production of proliferating precursor cells. Embryonic stem cells, ES cells, can be maintained indefinitely in culture and remain capable of differentiating into any cell type in the body. Induced pluripotent stem cells, IPS cells, which resemble ES cells, can be generated from cells of the adult human body by artificially driving the expression of a small set of key genes. Cancer cells fail to obey the social constraints that normally maintain tissue organization. They proliferate when they should not survive where they should not, and invade regions where they do not belong. Tobacco smoke causes more cancers than any other environmental mutagen. Cancers arise from the accumulation of many mutations in a single somatic cell lineage. Cancer cells are genetically unstable, having increased rates of mutation. Many show gross chromosomal abnormalities. Cancer cells typically express telomerase, enabling them to continue dividing when normal human cells would stop. Most human cancer cells harbor mutations in the p53 gene, allowing them to survive and divide when their DNA is damaged. The mutations that promote cancer can do so by converting proto-oncogenes into oncogenes, which are hyperactive, or by inactivating tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes can sometimes be identified through studies of rare cancer-prone families in which a mutation of one gene copy is inherited. Knowing the molecular abnormalities in the cells of specific cancers, we can now begin to design effective targeted treatments.